are interested in actually getting personalized, um, customized training programs to you, we're now opening up that service. So you can go to musclephd.com. I will tell you this, we can't take everyone because it is an individualized basis. So if you do want, we're only going to take um, a few people every month, maybe tops, maybe five people a month we might take and help them with customized training programs. We might even start less than that. But, it, because, but if you are interested in that, on musclephd.com there's an application process. So you can go on musclephd.com, you can apply. If you make it through that, that process, then we'll actually customize for you a total training program. And it's, it's going to be designed around your goal. So if you want to get, if you're like, hey, I want to put on 10 pounds of muscle, great. We'll put that program. If you're like, I want to get strong, great. I'll do that for you. If, if you're like, hey, listen, I'm more in shit, like my, my calves are small, I need to optimize them, your program's going to be optimized toward building huge calves, right? So, like I said, there's an application process, and we're, we're opening that now. And it's mainly as a service because we do appreciate you guys. We do, we do want to help you. We don't want to say no when you're asking um, for a customized training program. We really do care about you. So that's exciting announcement. And then next what I want to do um, for you guys is I'm, I'm going to start, I'm going to come back and give you some cool topics, some cool questions. I'm going to cover three questions and then I'll open up the floor for you guys to ask me a few questions today. And then we'll wrap things up. So one of the first questions that I think is interesting that I got, got asked earlier this morning was, what do you think about two-a-days? Like, is it good to do two-a-day training? Um, and I'm going to answer that question uh, uh, in, in the quick term and say, yeah, I think two-a-days are actually really good. Um, and I'm going to address that by a cool study that actually got done. So um, I think two-a-days are one of the best plateau busters in the world. They really are. And there was a really great researcher, one of my heroes. He's done more strength training studies than anyone ever, anyone ever. And his name is uh, Hakkinen. And Hakkinen has his laboratory in Yavaskula, the University of Yavaskula in Finland. And I remember it was actually the first international conference I ever spoke with, spoke at. I flew to Yavaskula and I got to meet Hakkinen. And this, this guy is just an amazing, amazing guy. And he did one of the first studies on two days. Now, how did he do it? He took elite weightlifters who were plateaued in muscle and plateaued in strength. They weren't making muscle gains. They weren't making strength. And he followed them for eight weeks. So say during eight weeks, say on average, they did eight sets of squats a day. He, eight sets of squats every leg workout, maybe eight sets of like, you know, deadlifts on every workout. And he followed them for eight weeks. He, he tracked their training volume. What happened? They were plateaued. No surprise. These guys were elite. They weren't making gains, strength, or muscle. Then he said, you know, I'm going to do something. I'm going to take half of the group. They keep doing their normal training volume. Take the other half of the group. They're going to do the same exact thing, except that they were doing eight sets of squats. Now they're going to do four sets of squats in the morning and four sets of squats at night. Okay? Same training volume. Did that for eight weeks. Guess what happened? The people who split their training volume into two-a-days made double the, no, triple the gains. They made gains in muscle mass. They made gains in strength. It was insane. People who had been plateaued opened it up again. Now, why is that the case? There's a lot of different reasons why that might be the case. Number one, when every time you train, you get an increase in protein synthesis. With highly trained individuals, that might only last two to four hours, okay? But if you train the morning and night, that's two times you're stimulating protein synthesis for two to four hours. So now instead of two to four hours, it's four to eight hours. You're increasing muscle for four to eight hours. On top of that, studies show that you get better neurological adaptations when you actually do, you get better neurological adaptations when you split your training up into morning and night, okay? Um, and that's called the spacing effect, that your nervous system gets better at performing a movement when it's split up. Now, why is that the case? Think about it for a second. From a nervous system perspective, when you first start squatting, the, the, the first couple warm-up sets, it's like, oh, this is hard. I, I got to fix my form. I got to get in the right rhythm. It takes three to four sets to get in that. And then after you hit four sets, you're just in a rhythm. So sets five, six, seven, and eight, while it might be hard physically, mentally, your nervous system, it's not getting taxed anymore because it's pretty much just in a rhythm. 
you're pulling from short-term memory. But if you do four sets in the morning, you come back to do four sets at night, you got to get back in that rhythm. That's when your nervous system makes the most adaptations. So I think the biggest thing that, that the biggest takeaway here um, is that the biggest takeaway here is that splitting your training into equally distributed morning and night sessions is a great way to bust through plateaus. So simply look at your normal training volume. If you normally do six sets of bench, do three in the morning, three at night. If you normally do eight sets of squats, do four in the morning, four at night. If you usually do biceps and you do 12 sets of biceps, do six in the morning, six at night. Spread that training volume out, and I guarantee you, you will bust through plateaus like you've never blessed through plateaus uh, before. So the next topic that I find super interesting um, that we were talking about earlier is rest periods. Question that I've gotten asked is, are rest periods different for like lower body and upper body? Uh, and the answer is, yes, they are different between upper body and lower body, right? So if you look at lower body training, um, uh, basically studies show that we, and this is crazy, we recover quicker on lower body training versus upper body training. Okay, now what I'm talking about is within a set, within a set. So studies show, for example, if I were to rest one minute between sets on leg press versus one minute between sets on bench press, my total repetitions per set on bench might go from 10 reps to six reps to four reps. Whereas on leg press, it might go from 10 to eight to seven. So, so resting shorter periods of time on upper body causes more fatigue than resting shorter periods of time on lower body. So just realize that when you're programming, that probably um, on, a, on a hypertrophy day, even if you're resting short periods, on your upper body, you might need to add an extra 30 seconds to sustain high training volume. So if it's a minute on lower body, for upper body, you might need to go 90 seconds, okay? So um, now, so, so and, and, and why is that the case? Well, probably because on lower body, you know, you kind of, in essence, um, can recruit, you, you know, if your quads start to burn out, you can kind of use your glutes more. If your glutes start to burn out, you can kind of power it up with a, with a different muscle group, okay? Um, whereas it's a lot harder to do that in upper body. Um, the, the, the next question that I also find very interesting um, is actually, um, do you need to rest differently between compound versus isolation movements? Do you need to rest differently between compound versus isolation movements? Well, what is the difference? A compound movement is also known as a multi-joint movement. And a multi-joint movement, in essence, means that you are um, working it more in one joint. So let's, let's take, for example, the bench press. I'm working at my elbow joint, I'm working at my shoulder joint, right? Whereas if I'm doing um, a cable fly, if I'm doing like a machine fly, I'm more isolating to the shoulder joint, okay? So I'm isolating my chest more in that case. If I'm doing leg extensions, I'm isolating at the knee joint, I'm focusing on the quads. If I'm doing squats, I'm working the quads, I'm working the hamstrings, I'm working the glutes, I'm working the spinal erectors, I'm working my trap. I'm working at more than one joint and more than one muscle. So what studies show is that you need much less rest to recover from isolation movements than compound movements. So I recover faster on isolation movements versus compound movements. So what that means is, let's say I'm doing a hypertrophy day. On my isolation movements on leg extensions, I might only need to rest 30 seconds on leg extensions, maybe 60. But if I'm doing squats or leg press, if I'm doing squats, for example, even on hypertrophy day, I might need to rest 90 seconds to two minutes. Does that make sense? So I recover much faster on isolation, 30, 60 seconds on a hypertrophy day versus 90 seconds to two minutes on a hypertrophy day on a compound movement like squats. So just factor that in mind when you're doing your list. Um, so again, like in summary, on, on that um, isolation movements recover faster, compound movements you need a lot more rest. So thank you so much guys. At this time I'll go ahead and I'll take a few questions. <clears throat> I know one of the questions we had was about diaspartic acid or DAA. Does that help strength gains at all? So that's a, so it's a really good question. Diaspartic acid. So diaspartic acid 
um, is a supplement that, that people take, um, an amino acid based supplement that individuals take to increase testosterone levels. Um, now, there is some data, especially like if you are suppressed in testosterone levels, like if your testosterone levels are lower, there's some data that deaspartic acid could actually help in increase testosterone. Now, the strength training literature on deaspartic acid is not super strong. There's some slight data to suggest that it might help with strength, but it's not going to make you a monster. It's not like taking testosterone. It's not going to make you a monster. But definitely, if you're dieting, for example, something that would normally suppress your testosterone, deaspartic acid may help keep your testosterone levels higher, and that could help with maintaining strength. Or if you're, your testosterone is low, it can help you with strength gains. So going back to um, splitting up frequency for certain body parts, we had a few people asking about splitting up like chest and triceps morning and evening or even back and biceps morning and evening. What do you think about that? So I think, okay, here's the thing. I think that, that there's advantages to splitting body parts up and there's advantages to combining body parts, all right? So think about this for a second. If I do bench press, if I do um, chest, um, and, um, and, and, and then I move to shoulders. Um, the chest workout, especially if I do flat and incline, will fatigue my shoulders. So if I go to shoulders immediately after that, I can burn my shoulders out, okay? Um, also, if I do bench press, if I'm doing chest and triceps, if I do heavy bench and then I move to triceps, my triceps are fatigued, I can burn them out, okay? Um, Charlie's doing research on deadlifts and their impact on lats and traps. You know, so if I do deadlifts, I might fatigue my traps, I can then burn them out. So the advantage to combining uh, um, these larger body parts with smaller body parts is you burn the small, you, you can burn the smaller body parts out faster. The disadvantage is I can't focus as much on that smaller body part. So for example, if I did back, I'm so tired, yeah, I only need a few sets to burn out my biceps, but can I really focus on my biceps? Probably not as much if I had a, a fresh workout on my biceps. So if I did back in the morning and then biceps at night, for example, I'd be able to hit my biceps with a lot more sets, okay? So that's an advantage to that. But I think my, my response to you is I would recommend doing both. So you do your compound movements, you do your back workout, just do three sets of biceps. You can just burn them out. And then later in the day, when you're fresh, focus on your biceps and do like 8 to 12 sets. Now you get the best of both worlds. There is also evidence um, um, from, from some research by Rostad out in um, Finland that in essence, if I do like compound movements, like if I do compound movements and I get a greater hormonal response, that doing smaller body part movements can increase the peak of the biceps. So in other words, if I, if I have a hormone response and then I train my arms, that, that might actually increase the size of my arms. So that's why my advice is a combination of both. All right, we've got another one here. How can I optimize nutrition and supplements post-ACL restruction and cartilage repair? So I think we could also uh, just kind of include any surgery in that. What are some nutrition supplement tips for after surgery? Right. So when you just had a surgery... You, you want to treat recovering from a surgery similar to like you would uh, treat recovering from hard training, okay? Studies show that, for example, right after the surgery, increasing protein intake is going to be very important. That your muscle, that your injuries more sensitive to recovery. So, number one, I would definitely increase your normal protein intake. At least get 1 to 1.5 grams a day of high quality protein. Number two, collagen. There are studies that actually show that consuming collagen um, can, is super beneficial for um, uh, replenishing or speeding recovery of muscle damage. Okay. Um, intriguingly enough, there's also amino acids that seem to help re speed, speed recovery from injury. Um, uh, so things like, for example, citrulline has been shown to increase speed recovery from injury. Um, and I think that's super important. So I definitely combine the collagen with, with um, citrulline. That seems to enhance those processes. Um, then 
Um, it's important to understand. There's, there's also another supplement that I think is really good. It's called UC2. UC2 um, is a patented ingredient from Lonza, and UC2 um, basically helps speed recovery of like cartilage and connective tissue. Um, so that's another thing that I think is very, very important. Now, the other thing is when you start to do your rehab, you have traditional rehab, and then there's techniques where you can train low intensity but speed recovery, and that's things like blood flow restriction training. So we've done, we've published studies where if you do blood flow restriction training, um, that's where basically you wrap the top of the limb with like, um, and obviously consult with your doctor on this, show them papers on blood flow restriction training. But if you get their approval, if you do blood flow restriction training, we found that it actually increases things like growth hormone and growth hormone um, specifically increases protein synthesis in um, connective tissue. So I think com the, the combination of the nutrition um, things that I advice that I gave you combined with blood flow restriction when you get to the rehab component of things can drastically speed recovery. Here's a good one. What is the difference between muscle stimuli, including mechanical tension, muscle damage, and metabolic stress? Oh, that is a great one. So basically, muscle grows in at least uh, uh, at least three different ways. Okay, like you pointed out, there's mechanical stimuli, there's metabolic stress, and there's what we call like cell swelling. Okay, each of those make muscles grow. So what's mechanical tension? That's lifting heavy weights. When you lift heavy weights, you have tension on the muscle, and that's a, a, a tearing tension. It causes muscle damage. That tension leads to muscle growth. Okay. That's mechanical tension. The second one is metabolic stress. When you're lifting weights and you feel that burn, that's lactic acid, that's different byproducts of contraction. A good friend of mine, David Gunderman, found that when you take muscle cells in isolation and you actually bathe them in lactic acid, they grow. So that's one. Um, so that, well, how do you do that? that, that um, that's like 8 to 12 reps. That's short rest period lengths, like 30 to 60 seconds rest. And it's also things like blood flow restriction. And then finally, there's the pump. When you train and you force blood into the muscle, it causes the muscle to swell. And when the muscle swells, it thinks it's in danger and it restructures itself to grow more. So, uh, intriguingly enough, going back to the guy, uh, going back to you who, who's rehabbing, just wrapping your limb with blood flow restriction actually causes the muscle to swell, and that swelling response causes growth. So, um, in fact, when you uh, it, just wrapping the muscle, Say you have a hard time making your calves grow. Wrap your calves at the top of the calves and walk on a treadmill. You won't get a ton of metabolic stress, but you get a huge pump, and that makes the muscle grow. So those are three different ways that muscle grows and three different ways to optimize that growth process. Great. Should I take HMB and creatine before or after my workout? As you guys know, it's my favorite question. <laughs> um, I think that we actually, I did a study um, a long time ago, published it in Nutrition Metabolism on the timing of HMB. And basically what we found is that consuming it before the workout was ideal. Um, that was published in 2009 in Nutrition Metabolism Journal. So definitely take a pre-workout. Um, uh, I, personally, I like to say it takes up all around the workout. I don't think it's either or. If you're on a budget, take it before. If you're not, take it before and after. Um, same thing with creatine. There was research, I believe, by Dr. Antonio that found that taking creatine after exercise was ideal. So you could take creatine after, but again, if you, creatine's pretty darn cheap, take it before and after. And by the way, if you're going to recover from exercise, you probably need to consume something with calories after exercise. Uh, here's one. Do you prefer fed cardio or fasted cardio to get rid of some stubborn fat? So, a lot of people criticize fasted cardio, say, oh, it doesn't work, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot of metabolic long-term adaptations that happen with fasted cardio. So what I would say is I prefer cardio in a depleted state. What do I mean depleted state? Cardio in a state where you don't have high insulin levels and cardio in a state where you don't have car high carbohydrate levels. So always do cardio, not with carbohydrates. Do your cardio in a low-carb state. So even if you're not going to fast, if you're just going to take some branched-chain amino acids and some medium-chain triglycerides, 
That'll give you energy to power through the cardio, but you'll deplete your muscle of carbohydrate sores, and that'll lead to fat burn. So either do it fasted or in a low carb, low calorie state. What are your thoughts on DHEA? So DHEA is an important um, hormone, pre-hormone, and DHEA um, can convert to testosterone. Um, it got really popular um, back in the 90s when um, basically Mark McGuire showed, it was in his locker room, and he had androstenedione in his locker, which is related to DHEA, okay? And both of those, in a long chain of events, convert to testosterone. So after that, everyone got into pro-hormones, and they actually started releasing some really cool pro-hormones, and then they all got banned, okay? So, but DHEA is old, old school classic. What I will say is this, DHEA um, is an androgen. When we get older, 50s, 60s, 70s, DHEA levels lower a lot. Consuming DHEA can actually raise testosterone levels in those cases. Or also if you did a contest prep and your testosterone is like close to zero, all your androgen levels are close to zero. Supplement with DHEA in that time when you're hypogonadal, when you have low test levels can help. If you're eating a bunch of food, your testosterone levels are really high, DHEA and you're young, DHEA may not help as much. But think about it, if you're in a bodybuilding, you're gonna be dieting, it's great then. If, if you're like everybody, you're gonna age, it's great as we age. So those are two times where I think DHEA can be beneficial. Is it gonna get you super jacked? Probably not. Can it optimize you in times where testosterone is impaired? Absolutely. What are your thoughts on intermittent fasting when training for strength? So I think intermittent fasting is super beneficial. What I will say is this, that, um, what I'll say is this, if you're trying to, um, if, you, if you're trying to make weight, um, intermittent fasting is a good way to, to make gains and not gain a lot of fat. So for example, um, and the strictness of that depends, right? So for example, if you are a power lifter and you're trying to gain strength and size, um, eating, throughout, eating throughout a 16 hour period of time means you're eating most of the day. Studies show that if you confine that to maybe 10 to 12 hours, even though you're eating excess calories, you won't gain as much fat. So I think intermittent fasting could be good for getting stronger and not gaining so much fat, but you need to not restrict your window too high. So if, you were, if you're intermittent fasting, you're only eating four hours a day, you're not going to get that strong. So you, you know, um, I would say eat at least have a feeding period of eight to 12 hours and cycle that. So a couple times a week, maybe two to three times a week, eat eight hours a day throughout an eight hour period. And then a couple times a week, eat 12 hour period. And then one to two times a day, just eat the whole day. You know, uh, if you're gonna get strong. <clears throat> are cluster sets effective for strength gains? So cluster sets are a very difficult topic. Traditionally, cluster sets can be defined as you're breaking your set up. Okay, so for example, let's say that I were doing um, a set of five. I might do one rep as fast as I, as explosive as I can, or I might do two reps as explosive as I can, I rack the weight. I might wait 30 seconds, then I do two more reps, I might wait 15 seconds, then I do one rep. Studies show that like with that, your strength gains wouldn't be as high as if you did five reps straight. Now, it depends. If you're resting short, it can be pretty brutal. So like, let's say you do one rep and you rack it and you rest five seconds, you pull it right off, you do another rep and you rack it, you rest five seconds, and you ended up doing six or seven reps instead of five, and by six or seven, you could barely do any more. Cluster sets could work very well in that, that time point, and it's a switch up. So if cluster sets make the set easier, you're not gonna get as strong. If cluster sets um, make the set just as hard or harder, it can help you. Another time where cluster sets could be good is like if you're maybe working on being more explosive and increasing your power output. In that case, having a little le less fatigue and focusing on being more explosive could be good. So, so, but you just want to cycle those around. What are your thoughts about intra-workout nutrition when trying to gain size? So intra-workout nutrition when trying to gain size, here's the thing. I think basically if you have a good meal and a pre-workout drink, 
like say you ate an hour to two hours before you trained, and then before you work out, you have a pre-workout supplement that's got beet, branched chain amino acids and you know maybe a few carbs or whatever, and you're training, and your training session lasts 45 minutes, I don't think inter intra workout nutrition is going to help that much, especially if you have a post-workout meal. Now, if you're doing hardcore, where you're, if you're training two hours, like old school Arnold Schwarzenegger style training, intra workout nutrition can help. If you're training more than 45 minutes, yeah, have another pre workout shake in the middle of it, keep yourself going. Slow or fast digesting carbs for a pre workout meal? Slow digesting carbs are probably better for a pre workout meal, but not too slow. In other words, like don't eat a salad before you, you do squats, you're probably going to throw it up. You know, but like oatmeal could be oatmeal could be light and it might not hurt your stomach. So I'd say more moderate to slow, but just nothing that hurts your stomach. Uh, what's your thoughts on ashwagandha? So ashwagandha is what we call an adaptogen. Basically, um, what I mean by that is that it adapts to certain situations, and typically it's very good at helping us buffer stress. So when we're doing hardcore training cycles. Um, if you are training hard and you have finals week or work is getting really stressful or you know your girlfriend or your wife gets pissed at you, ashwagandha is really good because you buffer stress and you keep training hard even though you know your significant other is like pissing you off or something like that. You keep training hard because ashwagandha helps buffer stress. What are some of your top uh, fitness or like exercise science books? You know, okay, here's the thing. There's not lots of great exercise science books because they really get dated. But if you first get started, you know, I think um, The Science of Strength Training by Kramer and Fleck is a must. That's one of the best books. If you get really advanced, um, there's a strength training book by Vladimir Zaskiorsky. Uh, don't ask me to dispel that, but... Um, but I think it's what, Z A T S I O R. There's a V in there somewhere. Yeah. It's like Zatz V V or Ski. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Very hard book to read. But the guys from Westside get a lot of their stuff from Vladimir Yaskiorsky. He used to work with William Kramer out of Penn State. So, um, you know, and, and so there, there's a lot of um, uh, um, really great books out there, but those are two great ones. I will tell you this, and this is a surprise. But we are working, we just filmed for like four hours before this. We're creating the, literally guys, we're creating the ultimate course on gaining muscle and strength. I mean, this course, it's going to be, it could take you a year to get, a year of hard study to get through it. You're going to have like, I think, 130 lectures. We're literally filming 130 lectures between myself, Charlie, Mo and Fernando creating an, an extravaganza. Uh, um, of in incredibleness, we are literally creating the ultimate course to where all all my education and undergrad, masters, PhD, twenty years plus of research in this field, we're taking all of that and giving it to you. Because here's the problem: most most schools don't care about gaining. They don't. They don't care about gaining muscle. I remember like when I was in school and I could take classes. It'd be like. Um, you know, I was like, oh, I'm excited. It's exercise physiology. And you spend half the course learning about the Krebs cycle, which, by the way, you spend half the course in, in biology 101 learning. And then you go to grad school, and the first thing you review is the Krebs cycle for three lectures. Okay? And then you get into your doctoral program, and they review the Krebs cycle for four lectures. Okay? And then you got to take classes with the med school students, and guess what they talk about? The Krebs cycle. Well, guess what? You don't care because you're trying to gain muscle. And so what we've done is we've taken all the fluff out, and literally you will walk out from this muscle PhD like course. You will literally have a PhD level understanding of um, of gaining muscle, right? You got myself um, with mighty degrees my training. You got Charlie, um, uh, who's has multiple degree, advanced graduate degrees, and we're giving you all that information, and it's going to be insane. So I would wait. Our plan is to launch that in October and November. Um, and then, of course, Muscle PhD site. We've got a lot of amazing articles on there that I would highly recommend reading. So, hey, maybe one more question? Yeah. 
Uh, this one's based off of our article I think we posted today. Do you think deadlifts should be programmed with legs instead of back, or does it matter? Well, that's a really good question, actually. <laughs> you know, since, since Charlie's the expert on that question, what are your thoughts, Charlie? Uh, do I need to step, step on step camera? In, yeah. step in. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm Charlie. I know you've seen uh, some of my stuff on the website working with Doc. Um, as far as deadlifts being programmed with legs or back, I think that article today uh, that we posted actually goes into that quite a bit. So ultimately it depends on your goals, like everything in fitness, right? So if your goals are to increase, you know, glute, hamstring, lower back size, putting deadlifts with a leg day might make sense for you. Um, if your goals are to increase, you know, trap or lat size, using things like rack pulls, block pulls, stuff like that, to kind of exaggerate and use those heavier weights could probably help your back days as well. Um, I think the last thing you have to think about there too is the accumulated fatigue that you get from using deadlifts in one workout or the other. So if you want to do squats, leg press, hack squats, lunges, all that stuff, I probably wouldn't add deadlifts to that mix because you have so much fatiguing exercises already, okay? Same idea with a back day, if you're going to be doing heavy rows, you know, lots of shrugs, other stuff like that, I wouldn't add deadlifts into that mix too. But if you want to get the most out of your deadlifts, I put them in one or the other towards the beginning where you're not fatigued at all. So ultimately, it depends on your goals. Um, I think you can use it for either or because it's going to be a great exercise um, for either or. Anything to add to that? No, I think that's it. And Charlie's actually doing his PhD. He's going to be a doctor here. He's doing his PhD on that exact topic. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, a topic that contributes to the literature. You'll know if deadlifts contribute to, like, you know, your lats, your traps. How you that question he's literally answering with his dissertation, so yeah. I think it's pretty so, cool stuff. So. We'll have a better answer for you here soon, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thanks, Charlie. You got Thank it. You. A lot cooler. I always I told Charlie it's a lot cooler in my dissertation. I took I had I did a lifelong study in rats <laughs> uh, in my dissertation. Um, but really cool, really cool topic there. And I think um, I think that's it. Like I said, guys, listen. A couple of things here. Um, again, just to reannounce, if you haven't been to the site, we made a bunch of updates. Go to musclephd.com. Also, like I said, if you weren't here at the beginning of this, a lot of times people do DM us and ask, hey, listen, um, can you help me with my training program? We're super busy. We, we, don't, we haven't had the time. But um, one thing Charlie suggested is say, hey, listen, we want to get back. So we, we are only taking on a few. We will we'll help with your training program. But we're only going to take on a few people on a customized training program. So if you go to the website, musclephd.com, you'll see there's an application process. And that's the reason why application process is, we wanna know you're serious because we're only taking on, probably the first month, we're probably only take like three people um, and, and max five. So like I said, you need to go onto that site, do your application, and then if you, if you show us you really want it, we'll help you out on that. Um, and then lastly, like I said, um, in November, um, we're gonna be launching this amazing 130 something lecture um, course that's going to make you a graduate level, doctoral, PhD level on understanding how to grow, how to get stronger, understanding and mastering your body. Thank you so much, guys. I'll see you next Wednesday.